Hello, my name is Michael Parker, and welcome to episode 14 of Antidote. When future generations look back on the 2016 presidential race, the person they may remember as being the most prophetic and influential is a man who stood no chance to win. And you may not even know his name, but he's here with us today via Skype. He's Mr. Zoltan Ishvan. He is the founder of the Transhumanist Political Party, and he is the 2016 Transhumanist Party presidential candidate. He's a futurist, he's a visionary, he is a science fiction best-selling writer. Mr. Isfahan, welcome to Antidote. Thank you so much for having me, I appreciate it. Mr. Isfahan, I became aware of you in the last few weeks, and I've been watching many of your interviews, reading your articles. You're a very interesting man, and on this show, we have covered transhumanism before. Actually, our second episode was with uh, Dr. Susan Snyder of the uh, Future of Institute of Humanity, I believe is the name of the, the group. Anyway. For those who do not know what transhumanism is, I was hoping you could explain it briefly and tell us why you feel so deeply about this that you would found a political party around it and then involve yourself in something as di difficult as a presidential candidacy run. Sure. Well, you know, transhumanism is, is really just, it's an international social movement of people trying to use science and technology to radically upgrade the human being and upgrade the human experience. Uh, literally, the word transhuman means beyond human. So uh, transhumanists are trying to go beyond what the normal human being is. And um, I have been involved with the movement for, you know, about three or four years actively, but been a transhumanist for maybe 10 or 20 years before that. But the, um, there was always a political element moving in transhumanism. And the one thing, you know, to know about is that the movement is exploding in size it's especially exploding with younger people, ages uh, 16 to about 35. And we've seen growth in a you know, thousand percent in just the last year or two years. So we now have a couple million people that are actively calling themselves transhumanists around the world. And I decided to found the Transhumanist Party as a way to um, bring transhumanism into uh, the, the political picture, mainly because it, it poses a lot of civil rights challenges. Um, you know, does everyone want to live indefinitely, which is one of transhumanism's uh, main goal? Does everyone want robotic hearts? What about artificial limbs? Uh, what about artificial intelligence? So it needed a political component, and that's where I decided to um, found the Transhumanist Party. You mentioned living indefinitely, and here's one of the parts where I'm a bit confused because you have said in several interviews that Listen, I'm not saying that we should live forever, and you've even said that there, most transhumanists are not saying we should live forever, yet you are proposing, espousing, championing life extension technology, which to me, and also the stated goal of transhumanism is to overcome death. So explain the subtle difference here that we're looking at. Well, sure. I think what's most important is that most transhumanists believe and think that they want to live forever. And the reason they want that is because, like myself, they love life and they think being alive is a miracle in itself, and they want to preserve that life. They see no reason to die. But I think from a public point of view and a policy point of view, especially as, you know, in America where 85% of the nation is pretty much Christian and they believe you sort of have to die in order to meet God in heaven and have that afterlife, there's this kind of conflict. So we, as a, as a policy in the movement, try to say, we want to live indefinitely and have the right to do that. But that doesn't mean that we also don't have the right to die. I think most transhumanists would easily advocate for saying, well, what we're looking for is to take away the kind of bite of death. We just don't want death to, to, to determine when we have to die. We don't want to, uh, our death to be determined by cancer, uh, determined by auto accidents, determined by whatever means death uh, comes and takes people away. We want to have the choice when and where to die, if we're going to die at all. And those are the subtleties. I understand that, and uh, I'm glad to hear that because I think that in many people's minds, what they're picturing is some kind of Johnny Depp uh, science fiction movie or something where the transhumanist views this idea of, my God, I'm gonna upload my mind to a computer, I'm gonna live forever in this near God-like state, and frankly, that creeps a lot of us out. Um, so when you put it in the terms that you put it, it makes it more real, and I understand that. And by the way, I can tell by the room that you're in that you are a father and a family man, and that was another reason that I gravitated to you because the subjects of transhumanity, one of the things that's so touchy about it is this separation of the corporal physical being from 
um, uh, into machines. So the fact that you are a father, it, it, it meant something to me, and I'm, I'm rambling, but let me go on. Another interesting thing about you is that you are, as far as I know, the first openly atheist candidate for president. Uh, I believe I am. I certainly am the first kind of visible one. You know, I, I have my national columns and I do a lot of TV stuff. So I'm kind of the first popular one, maybe of the thousands and thousands of candidates, especially the very small ones. There has been one, but we haven't been able to find one. So I, apparently I am the first atheist presidential candidate. And it is an important part of my platform. Um, it's, it's not that I'm trying to, you know, kind of create conflict with... Um, religious-minded people, but I do believe that having a secular government uh, and a real separation of religion and state, not the kind of quasi one that we have now where churches uh, don't have to pay taxes and stuff like that, and you know, uh, almost 100% of Congress is religious, I'm talking about a real secular uh, kind of minded government, a real um, let's leave God out of the picture. So that's one of the th main things I'm trying to push with my presidential candidacy. And of course, a number of transhumanists, a great number of transhumanists are either atheists or agnostic. And um, you know, it, it's science. It's not based on any kind of uh, fantasy or fairy tales or anything like that. And again, I'm not saying that religion is bad because certainly some transhumanists are religious. It's just we're trying to make um, transhumanism right now something that appeals only or something that searches out only logic, only rationality, only reason, and only science in the way that it's not moved because we have had, you know, uh, teachings taught to us thousands of years ago by prophets or whatever. It's just moved by, uh, by the, you know, the scientific method is perhaps our, our, our greatest guide point of what, uh, how transhumanism moves forward. This is one of the most exciting things to me about your candidacy because, listen, I am a constitutionalist and the separation of church and state is very important to me. You mentioned that many of these Congress people are Christian or religious. You know what, that's what they say. We don't know if they are really or not. So they're posturing. And by aligning themselves with the religion, a lot of times they're doing that strictly to gain public support, which they then in turn can translate into another form of nationalism, and we start bankrolling wars overseas. I think you know where I'm going with that. But um, I wanted to bring that up because I like the fact that you're an atheist, actually. I am not an atheist, but I like the fact that you are, and we need to interject these different types of ideas and freedoms back into the conversation about government. Um, another thing that interests me about your work, this past week, the news has been dominated, for better or worse, by the Caitlyn slash Bruce Jenner story. And you have mentioned that the LGBT movement and transhumanism share a lot of things in common and that they would actually be one of your targeted groups and your strategy in your campaign. Explain what those, uh, what, explain what you both share with the LGBT and transhumanist movements. Well, the most important core philosophy of transhumanism is this idea of morphological freedom. And you know, in a nutshell, it just says, you have the right to do with your body whatever you want, so long as it doesn't hurt anybody. And I think almost everybody agrees with morphological freedom. And it's also one of the most important tenets of the LGBT movement. So, you know, naturally, we have, transhumanists have been reaching out to the LGBT community, which is huge, much bigger than the transhumanist community, and I'm um, saying, well, look, we share these similar things. In fact, the LGBT community, um, the, the future of the LGBT movement is going to be changing dramatically over the next 10 and 15 years as, you know, sex changes, as um, you have all sorts of technologies that literally change the way we look at um, procreation, like artificial wombs or j designer babies, or do you engineer in certain traits? Do you engineer in LGBT traits if that's something that you wanted? There's so much happening with the LGBT movement right now, um, and it's happening because of transhumanist technology. So it's a very natural thing to try to merge the two movements and, um, and say, hey, we're on the same team. Let's put our forces together and see if we can make some change in America and around the world and get more people open to this idea of morphological freedom, which essentially says, hey, let's really protect our freedoms because freedom is perhaps the most important thing we all have. I would agree with that. What has been the response from the LGBT community to transhumanity? Very good so far, very good so far. Um, 
most people are, you know, there's some a little bit of historical conflict because the LGBT has gone through a huge amount of historical uh, pushing to gain their rights. And so they're not very happy in some t ways that you have another movement that's kind of saying, well, we're, we're on the same team. But at the same time, they also realize that transhumanism is the future. LGBT and transhumanism are going to be hand in hand no matter how you look at it because you know, technology affects everyone's lives. And so if you want to uh, you know, be a part of the 21st century, you're going to be embracing, embracing this technology. And I mean virtual sex, haptic suits, uh, experiences like that. This is all what's going to happen. So it's very natural that they would want to, you know, kind of go down the road together as, as partners and as teammates as we try to find um, even better paths to more civil rights. And, uh, you know, I, I've also argued, for example, that marriage probably won't exist in 50 years. So this also kind of turns the LGBT marriage thing into, a, a, you know, a, a, a further conversation as we ask, well, you know, what really is marriage in the world when we are mind uploading ourselves or when we're having, you know, living a thousand years, let's say, and no one's really having children anymore because they wouldn't have it in the first 500 years of their lives or, or something like that. So I think that, you know, together we make a great team and they're, they've been embracing transhumanism. There's no question about that. You know, for example, Tim Cook at Apple, who has said that he's gay. And I mean, he's a classic transhumanist. Look at the technology that they're creating. And they're soon going to be creating, you know, iPhone cranial implants and stuff like that. So it's very transhumanist. I'm excited by the welcome we've had. But at the same time, it's, it's important to respect the historical progress that the LGBT movement has made because they've gone through um, some very tough times to arrive where they are. And I very much respect that. Understood. You mentioned Tim Cook. One of the interesting things about transhumanism, you just started the party officially how long ago? About nine months ago now. Okay. And you're saying, I think, I believe a number that I saw was that there was about 25,000 members in the U.S. I'm sure it's grown past that since, right? Yes, I think it's grown a little bit. What happened was, you know, the support came from all over almost immediately. We're, we're you know, we have about 150,000 transhumanists in America who I believe would say, if you said, you know, give them a piece of paper, here's a survey, are you a transhumanist, dot the box, who would say that. And um, of that 150,000, you know, I can actively see around 25 to 30,000 people supporting the party, donations, talking about events, wanting a, a my bus tour to come through and stuff like that. Um, we think it's going to grow much bigger than that very soon. And it, the 25,000 number is actually quite conservative because we're wondering how many other supporters there are just in terms of the atheism of the campaign or, for example, the LGBT emphasis of the campaign or the other you know, thing we've been reaching out to is a lot of disabled people who might just support us or want to be members just because of the technology we're bringing to try to make people totally physically abled. And um, so it might be much bigger than that, but the 25,000 num uh, number is just kind of a conservative estimate of where we stand today. And I think we would gain a lot more voters than that uh, when election time comes. I agree with you. And the reason that I brought that up is when you said Tim Cook, I theorize, and I'm sure this has crossed your mind, that you certainly have more supporters than are visible. Um, when I think of transhumanism, and this is kind of the positive and negative sides of it, I know that you've addressed this and we're going to go into it later in the interview as well, but I would think that many people who are wealthy in places of power towards the end of, our, of their older in age, Yes, they are going to be on board with these ideas of transhumanism. Now, whether they are public about that stance or not is another thing, but many of these people would be affluent. Many of these people could support the movement, and I think that there are a lot of people who are transhumanists who may not be calling themselves that and would support you. Oh, I, I would say the closet transhumanist community, <laughs> we, we refer to it as that, is probably a 10 to 20 times bigger than the actual community. And there's a lot of reasons why. Um, you know, for example, even Singularity University, um, for example, their campus is part of the NASA campus in uh, Silicon Valley, and that's on government-sponsored territory. And again, here we run into this classic conflict where you have a, a major, what we'd call, you know, transhumanist university started by Peter Diamandis and Ray Kurzweil, who are obviously transhumanist-minded people, um, but they're on a government campus where funding and stuff like that comes from. And here you are with 100% basically religious people in Congress. It just doesn't make sense to openly declare yourself 
something that is known for being radical or known for being controversial. It's just easier to say, hey, I'm a technologist and I love technology. But I think if you actually put it to a vote or put it to a, you know, a survey, you would find that potentially hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in America actively support transhumanism and would be happy to call themselves that if it, if it didn't bring the kind of ire of, you know, of government uh, officials or just uh, cause too much uh, controversy in public. But we're working on that image. Um, and I spend a huge amount of my time um, writing my national columns and trying to plug transhumanism in a very positive light to say it's not some fringe movement anymore and it's no longer science fiction. What it really is, is just a bunch of people that just want to use science and technology to make everybody live better, to make everyone live longer, and to just improve people's health. And so we've really been emphasizing the health angle. Because when you talk about health, then all of a sudden transhumanism isn't weird anymore. Then it's like, oh, well, it's health, it's great. You made a humorous remark, um, or I thought it was humorous, and you were talking about morality. And you were saying morality is related directly to mortality. <laughs> and your morality may change as you get closer to your mortality. Talk about that for a second. Well, sure. You know, interestingly enough, that's the most important philosophical line in my novel, The Transhumanist Wager. And a lot of what I'm even doing as a futurist is sort of based on the popularity of that book a few years ago, which, um, you know, did very well in philosophy and sold very well. So um, basically the idea or the, the line is that, you know, our morality, humans' morality, is, dis is determined by the amount of time we have left to live. And you can see this even in war zones. If you feel you're about to be killed, you act quite differently than you would right now during an interview when, you know, you're going to go have lunch afterwards in a little bit and, you know, have a, you have a nice life. So one's morality is actually determined in, by context and determined by the amount of time they have left to live. And I often think this is very important because one of the main, you know, purposes of the transhumanist uh, movement in, the, in its entire agenda is to try to make people live longer and hopefully conquer death. And as people get older, I believe they have more of a reason to spend more resources, more time, and more passion in trying to overcome death, especially in the 21st century when it's a very good, a lot of experts will say that within 10, 15, 20 years, we might have the power to stop aging and reverse aging. There's already been some successful tests done in mice. We have 3D printing of organs happening. We can might even be able to do mind uploading in 20 years. There's a lot of different ways to conquer death and overcome biological uh, human death with technology and science. And so this idea of morality changing the closer we get to death is a very important, I think, transhumanist concept. And uh, so a lot of people talk about it. And uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's very important to me, especially as I've been a journalist in war zones. And I can tell you, the closer you get to almost dying, uh, your perception changes. I think there is no way anybody could deny that. Another group that you talk about targeting in your campaign is that of disabled people. And it makes a lot of sense. However, recently you really uh, kind of upset some people. You came out against a $1.3 billion plan to repair the sidewalks of Los Angeles. And I believe this was a lawsuit that was filed by the Americans with Disabilities Act. You came out against this, but you had an interesting reason for that. Explain why. Sure, so this has been one of the more interesting developments of my campaign because you would think um, on the, from the outside that you know, one of the main things about transhumanism is we want to help everybody. We want to help everyone be healthier, uh, more physically abled. We as a, as, a, as a group don't believe that the human beings are perfect. We think we're in a state of improvement. We're in a state of evolution. So transhumanists want to speed up that evolution and make improve the human body. Um, and so LA, and I grew up in LA, so I know it. And I'm also, uh, I used to build houses, so I also know quite a bit about building sidewalks. Because every time you build a new house, you generally have to build new sidewalks as well. And um, LA came out with this idea to spend, you know, over a billion dollars on sidewalks for the disabled people, mostly in wheelchairs and stuff like that, so that they could have easier access. And I said, well, why, instead of spending a billion dollars on sidewalks in LA, why not spend it on exoskeleton technology, which is this skeletal suit that is already allowing paraplegics and quadriplegics to walk again. And I think the real important thing before I go on is to understand that LA was setting a precedent for the rest of the country. This was not a $1 billion decision. This was a $50 billion decision that was gonna to spread to New York, to Chicago, to Atlanta, to every single city. So this set a precedent. And I said, the exoskeleton industry, which is one of the most promising industries 
in, in all science and engineering right now um, is a small, small industry, five hundred million dollars maybe, maybe a billion at most. But it, it's even with a fifty companies, it's a tiny industry, and yet it has the potential to completely make it so that the wheelchair industry completely will be eliminated at some point in the future because everyone will be able to put on an exoskeleton suit and run and climb mountains and uh, <laughs> to go hiking. And you would think that that would be better than um, being in a wheelchair. What I didn't understand though is that there's a full culture of disability. And that culture has been ingrained in people for a, uh, a long time, especially if you've been in a wheelchair your whole life. You may not find the idea of you know, walking around in, a, in an exoskeleton suit useful. So I, you know, I didn't see that, and there was some controversy that come about that, but I think what a lot of people don't realize is that if you put, put a billion dollars into the exoskeleton industry, you would transform it. And probably within five or 10 years, you would have 50 to 100 times better uh, quality exoskeleton suits. And that would redefine disability. It would redefine this concept of ableism when you know, they say it's discriminatory to you know, assume that people want to be able-bodied. I believe that everyone wants to be able-bodied. I meant no harm, and I still stand behind my beliefs that I would love to get every single person out of a wheelchair that would like to be out of it, out of one, and into an exoskeleton suit. Exoskeleton suits are going to allow us to run faster than cheetahs someday, probably in the next 15 years. So um, I'm a big believer in that type of technology, and that's where I would spend the money. I wouldn't spend it on sidewalks. I would spend it on, on eliminating disability altogether. Understood. And I get your point of view. It was just interesting to me because it was not something I'd necessarily thought of in that framework. And these are the types of things I think that people will have to grapple with uh, when they start thinking about this idea of transhumanism. And it's a very logistically easy thing to get your head around. Fixing the sidewalks are giving people who are quadriplegics or disabled in some way a way to move. My personal preference would, we, would be that we have both. Good sidewalks and, and exoskeletons. Oh, no. and, and of course, I wanted both. And I think what happened in that article is people, as a politician, I can't make up where the money would come from. Certainly. I have to say, you know, we have a $1.3 billion settlement. That's the money we have to work with. Instead of sidewalks, uh, of course, I would love to do both. And if I was voted into president, you know, I would, I would do both. I would find the money from somewhere. But, um, you know, the article in itself was really just about trying to not create fake money out of some thin air and just say, well, this is an industry. In 10 or 15 years, we can make it so um, that, um, you know, wheelchairs are not a part of our, our future, are not a part of uh, who we are as a species anymore. And I thought that would be a great thing. Let's kill the wheelchair. I'm not completely disagreeing with you. It's just very interesting. When I listen to you, I hear a bit of a libertarian streak. And uh, personally, I like that. I am not a Republican. I am not a Democrat. I hate the term independent because it just kind of seems like you're wishy-washy. But I take each issue on its own. And I vote for individuals. I do not vote for parties. But like yourself, I think the government has its nose far too deeply in our business. Um, you've talked about Bush stopping stem cell research. So I guess my question to you is, and this will lead into another question about defense spending, but what would you do to remove these obstacles or to streamline the process to get us back into innovative science that might be uh, difficult for some people to get their heads around? Well, you know, and one of the things I've advocated for, and I have an interview coming out hopefully shortly here that is going to um, talk a little bit more about this. It's controversial, but I have advocated, and I have written an article for, in my column for Psychology Today about this, saying that I believe it should be a crime when you stop life extension science uh, in some way. And I think, actually, when, for example, the Pope doesn't uh, advocate for condom use in Africa, and then you have literally more people dying from AIDS than the Holocaust, this in itself is a crime. In, you know, and we consider the condom a classic transhumanist technology because it, it's a life extension device. That's what it does is it protects people from getting diseases. And I think the same thing with George W. Bush. I said, you know, if you're going to stop that type of, um, you know, science that will let people live longer, that will get people out of wheelchairs, that will help them to, to live, then there's something wrong. There's something, in fact, illegal. And I believe that those things need to be brought to justice. Those, those concepts need to be 
you know, we have to have some kind of law that's set up and saying, whatever you do is fine, but again, morphological freedom. You're hurting somebody by holding up religious or cultural beliefs by being against stem cells. And that's what George W. Bush did for that seven years when he banned the federal funding. So we as transhumanists believe that you should always be able to innovate when it concerns improving people's health and lengthening their lifespans, but especially improving people's health. You should not be able to, for cultural reasons, stand in the way of that. And there needs to be some type of legal precedent to, to, make, to enforce that. And, um, and that's a very important part of my uh, policy, and you're going to be hearing me talking more and more about it. It's controversial because uh, so many religious people in America, but it's very libertarian. And yes, I sign on to many, many libertarian ideas, and uh, my novel's known as a, a libertarian book. And so, uh, you know, this is this idea that you just need to let technology and science go where it may, as long as it's not hurting somebody. And clearly, you know, stem cell development was, is not hurting somebody. Uh, clearly, usage of condoms is not hurting anyone. It's those, both those things are dramatically helping health. As a human being and a father, one of the things, another thing that you said that I, it really resonated with me is this idea that everyone should be able to go to college. Everyone has a right to education and it should be free. Can you talk about that? Yeah, well, we, it just only makes sense that we would make education free for the species. Uh, it, it's crazy. But, you know, I understand you don't want to make some things free, you know, maybe not give housing. People should earn that or something like that. But education seems like the most basic universal right. So why make it expensive? Why make it hard so that people say, oh, I'm not going to go to college because it's just too expensive? I believe that we should just make college free. But it's not only college. I also think we should make preschool free. Um, my kids right now, uh, I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old. And uh, the four-year-old, the preschool costs a lot of money. Uh, frankly, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a downer. And uh, I can easily understand why people would be avoiding it. But, you know, if you st start preschool earlier, you're going to get two extra years of education. And then if you have college, you're going to get an extra four. So there's six years extra in education. That's approximately 30% more than you're going to have over your lifetime otherwise. And that's fantastic. Imagine a species with 30% more education. That's something you want to meet on the people on the street. You want to talk to them about um, the physics that Einstein invented. You want to talk to them about science. You want to talk to them about culture and things like that. And generally, a lot of that stuff only comes out in college later when you're sort of sophisticated enough and old enough to understand it. I think the other thing that I've uh, advocated for is that I believe that college should be mandatory. I know this is controversial, and you may not like this from a libertarian point of view, but people are living twice as long as they did when we started making the rules of how long you have to go to school in the first place. Most of the rules for high school, for example, uh, you have to at least be in school till 17, age 17, were, were made when, in the 1960s when people were still only living to 60. Well, now they're living to 85, and in 20 years, everyone's going to live to 120. Education needs to grow as... Um, education levels need to grow as lifespans grow. It, that's the natural kind of course for a species. So I've also been pushing for longer periods of school, but making it free so that everyone that gets, you know, everyone gets to go for free and it's not a hardship in any way. Zoltan, I would argue that education is the least invasive human upgrade of all. So, I mean, there shouldn't be anything too controversial about that. Mandatory college, that's an interesting idea. Um, we are certainly lagging behind other countries in higher education at the moment. So I'm, it's certainly something to look at and think about. And college, the whole industry costs way too much money. So oh. I applaud you for looking into this. Now, you brought something up, because we're going to have to wrap this up pretty quickly. Let's say you get everything you want, and we are living longer. All of a sudden, my lifespan extends from 65 to 165, or 365. First of all, brother, how am I going to afford that? So that brings up this idea, I believe you were calling it a universal base income, which brings up yet another concept, which is there's already people who bemoan this idea that there are people on welfare and they're, you know, that they're defrauding the system and they're not adding anything back into. So how do we pay for it? What is this universal base income? And how do we pe keep people engaged and innovating and being part of society, not just vegetables. Sure, well, I, my campaign and the Transhumanist Party supports a universal basic income. This idea that everyone should be given a check every month that at least meets the basic um, kind of poverty limits so that you, no matter whatever you want, you have that covered. 
But the reason we're advocating for that is because no matter where you look, robots are starting to take away jobs. Software is taking away jobs. Um, for example, the, the big trucking industry, one of the biggest, you know, has most employees of, um, in America, they're going to have automated trucks in five years. They're going to be driverless trucks. And that entire set of three or four million drivers are going to be out of a job and they're not trained to do anything else. So, well, I don't know, most of them are not. So how are they going to live without starting to put together Molotov cocktails and, re and revolting? Um, so we, and the same thing is happening in every single industry that you can look at. Even my wife, who's a doctor, eventually a, 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 a robot is going to be better at um, doing her job than her. And um, so we need a way to transition to this type of new society where nobody really works because robots have taken over most jobs. And um, that the universal basic income is the simplest and easiest way to do it because at least everyone is guaranteed a kind of basic income to live on, to provide housing, clothing, and some basic stuff. Now, if they want to earn more money than that, as other, most, I'm sure most people want to do, at least they'll have the basics covered. And it's a really important concept in the world where robots are starting to take away people's jobs. This will keep, the, I think, the world from revolting uh, because most people generally like the idea of not working and not having a boss, not having a nine to five um, and kind of being a part of that grind. They can go to college. That's, again, why we support free college so they can have other things they want to do. And it's not just free undergraduate college. It's multiple PhDs if they want to take it for some reason. Um, so the idea is that we would try to create a much more utopian society where people don't have to work, but they still have the basics covered. They can go into new careers or whatever things that they want to do. And it might not only be for making money. You know, I, I think money's great, but it'd be great better if people would do things because they had a passion. Now, the big question with all this is how do we pay for this? And this is a difficult um, a very difficult one. There's a couple different ideas, but basically it's going to require probably some higher taxes. But the good news about that is that right now we're already paying quite a bit in taxes for welfare, but welfare would be removed with the universal basic income because it is a form of welfare in itself, except it's applied to everyone, to rich, to poor. It's sort of like Alaska. You take in the natural resources from the world, you're taking the natural resources from development in the 21st century, from all companies that are contributing, and you're basically gonna say now, Everyone is taken care of on those basic levels, and let's see what they want to do with the rest of their lives. And so it, it, it sounds, um, I think a lot of people actually like it. I even think a lot of the rich people like it, because then they say, well, I don't feel so bad taking away their jobs with robots, because I know that they're going to be taken care of. I understand. I guess my main concern is just maintaining purpose and maintaining innovation and not winding up like the second half of Wally. I'm sure you've seen that film. Of course. That is the big dilemma. And I, to be honest with you, I don't even have really the best ideas about that yet. Um, will people go into call, you know, start becoming experts in art? Will they maybe just want to do sail around the world all the time. It's hard to, maybe the space industry will make people travel around. It, it's very hard to know what people are going to do to keep meaning in their lives. But I think it's easier to keep meaning in their lives than it is to work at a nine to five job. So I'm, believe, I'm a believer that people are going to find new things that they're passionate about. And, uh, and hopefully that'll be education. Again, we always just say, go back to school and study whatever you always wanted to study and become an expert on it. I like that. My last question, and clearly I know you've stated it, you are not going to win. You have done this to expand the conversation, to make the front runners address some of these issues, which are very real issues and are coming towards us like a train. We are going to have to start talking about these issues. So I have to ask you the one that's on my mind and the one that's on many, which is the final destination. As we move away from a corporeal body into some inorganic or digital state, how are we going to maintain our humanity and our empathy towards others? And I'm, I'm serious about this because when we talk about when a child is born and it nurses off the mother, when you embrace your significant other, when you feel the touch of a friend, it, there's just something that is tactile that we respond to on a primal level. Or when we go to a rock show or a football game or something. There's a, we, as people, need the touch and feeling of others. So I'm trying to get my head around how that extends into the digital or, or 
post-organic state. That worries me. Sure. Well, first off, I just I think as an example, some of the robotic arms and robotic hands that they have now have far more sensitivity than your own hand. So just bear in mind that uh, they can feel heat uh, without even touching things. So when you talk about what we're going to become in the future, bear in mind that technology is going to um, improve our senses and add to our senses and maybe even create new forms of sensation and senses um, rather than losing them just because they think it's machine or cold-like. I think that's one of the common uh, misconceptions about technology is that it becomes, it's going to somehow remove our humanity. What it's not realizing, I think, a lot of people is that it might add to it in many ways that we were unable to do so as these, uh, these sort of these biological meat bags that were limited in scope. Um, we might have much deeper feelings of empathy, much deeper feelings of love. We might have much more radical sex with, um, uh, as a robotic uh, body and with robotic parts, with all sorts of new types of sensations that only could be created through technology. People often say, you know, I'm going to get bored if I live forever as a robot. But what they're forgetting is that their mind is most likely, especially if it's mind, it's uploaded into some machine, is going to be 10,000 or even a million times smarter than it is now, which means we're not just going to be living in one reality. There might be hundreds of realities that we coexist in all the time. It could be crazy in, in terms of its complexity. We have no idea how spectacular the rest of the universe is once we increase our intelligence. And the same thing is going to go for, we might not have any idea how much we're going to love one another until we actually embrace some of this more radical technologies that enable us to love more. So I'm actually a big believer, and history has sort of shown this so far, that technology has made life better. It has made us able to be closer to one another. For example, I just traveled to Europe and I was able to Skype with my family and with my kids um, as opposed to being away for three days with no connection. I believe overall technology is something that's going to bring us all closer to one another and it's one of the main reasons that I embrace uh, transhumanism because I do believe it's something that makes the world a better place. I do not disagree with you. I had to ask that question and I will say in my personal belief much of this is inevitable and you are one of the first people to put it in a way that I've personally responded to. So I really applaud what you're doing. You are adding subjects into this presidential campaign that we need to talk about. It's not just about transhumanism. It is about separation of church and state. It is about physical uh, and, and sexual equality. It's about a lot of things that I think we need to be talking about. So I really appreciate what you're doing. I wish you continued luck. Uh, Zoltan Isvan, thank you for appearing on Antidote. And uh, please stay in touch with us. I'd like to check in with you as the campaign continues. Oh, I would love that. And thank you so much for having me on, on your show. I very much appreciate that. You're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, my name has been Michael Parker. This has been episode 14 of Antidote. I hope that you've enjoyed it. And if you like what we do here, please subscribe to the Lip TV and Lip TV 2. Until next week, you, me, this world we live in, all of us, every single one, we are the antidote.